بوكو بعتميني كيف خمس عدات لي اقدو ما نولو انو من هاوي ومن لاوي وايكم حلالي وايكم وي نعم تاوي مستاي ممشتاعي على بيك عالم وما صد وما زغضان حل امر امر ساوي لان ثلاثي حماري وثلاثي بيتفنك امي أجل مش أجل لي أنا محلي لهم قاصر لي شو عم يعاد؟ نعم لأنه لي لهم قاصر لي لم يخي غيره لي لا باقيني يبتل حيلة مزيزة قريانا بطورة يا دي يا دي خويته يا سيري ايه لا تبعينه سيدي ايه ابحث يا بابا وخير الله شدحتيني آه لم بلجو لم بلجو عربي با با بيدر تتبع دوكا عربي عربي ها والله ما والله قريري لو قريري لو شلاتي لفيني ومن يا روها آتي لفيني ما خلص لي The cry unheard was raised during the First World War. It was the time when the sharp swords were brandished through the air, the time when the sound of shots and guns ruined the sleep of children slumbering in their cradles, an era of sound and sorrow which colored the world red by blood and became a mark on the brow of the 20th century, a mark that wouldn't be wiped off. It was the time when Mesopotamia, the land that could pride itself of Gulgamesh and Ankido, searched for the elixir of life. Sargon, who founded the first state. Hammurabi, who instituted the first laws known to man. Ashurbanipal, who built the comprehensive library, when this very land had to witness the killing of its children. Assyrians, Syriacs, whose cries were to echo through their fatherland and yet never be heard. The history of the Assyrians Syriacs goes back to 4500 BC. The two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, water their holy land, mentioned in the Bible, which is why the Greeks called the land Bethnarin or Mesopotamia, the land of two rivers. This was the birthplace of writing, literature, eposes, the almanac, agricultural technique, astronomy, the first cities, the Tower of Babel, the Hanging Garden of Babylon, the Ishtar Gate, and much more. Thus, scientists and archaeologists agree that it was the Assyrian Syriacs who lay the foundations of today's civilization and called their land the cradle of our civilization. After the downfall of the Babylonian and Assyrian empires, the very people who led us away from ignorance and barbarism were themselves to fall victim to the sultans who then reigned over Beth Narin. The Assyrian Syriacs are also considered the first Christians, and their missionaries spread Christianity as far as China and India. This religious conviction then proved to pave the way for the massacres and genocide they were later to encounter. After the 18th century, technological progress established itself among the European bourgeoisie and the slogan liberty, equality and fraternity spread like wildfire through Europe. However, the Ottoman Empire, which now reigned over Beth Narin, had stopped its development and therefore lost many of its land areas. In order not to lose further territory, the rulers intensified the oppression of the Christians within the empire with forced conversion being one measure. The Ottoman Empire followed the laws of the Quran, Sharia, that is, Muslim law, and by law separated Christians from Muslims. The Christians living in the empire were called Ahil Zima, people in need of protection. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the Christians of the Ottoman Empire were made to pay heavy taxes to the governing Ottoman rulers. There were no limits to the oppression and persecution of Christians. 
To separate them from the Muslims, the Christians were not allowed to walk on the pavements, ride horses, or carry weapons. They couldn't be politically involved. They also had to wear clothes that distinguished them from Muslims. When a Christian died, the body was dragged on the ground instead of carried on the shoulders. The Christians were craftsmen and merchants, and they contributed to two-thirds of the wealth of the Ottoman Empire. Their children were educated in Europe and adopted the European mentality. For example, the nationalist consciousness, which developed after the French Revolution in 1789. The trade with Europe, combined with the European missionaries who'd arrived in the country, further strengthened the nationalism among Christians. The Serbs, the Greeks, the Armenians, and the Assyrians, Syriacs. These nationalist currents caused, for instance, the Balkan War in 1912, which resulted in freedom for this province that had broken away from the Ottoman power. By now, the Ottoman Empire was constantly met with resistance from groups of people in different parts of the empire, people who revolted as they sought more liberty, equality, and fraternity. The Christians kept in constant contact with European ambassadors to express their protests against the oppression. In 1899, the Itihad Teraki party was founded. The slogan of the party also translates as liberty, equality, and fraternity. And its first purpose was to defend the rights of the different peoples. However, after the Paris Congress in 1907, led by Ahmed Risa and his friends, the party's line of policy was changed. The main goal now became to save the Ottoman Empire. The nation of Turkey was formed, and with it, a racist ideology. Turk Islam Sentesi, which united religion and state. Those who didn't acknowledge the ideology should either be killed or forcibly converted. This ideology, one language, one nation, one flag and one religion, constituted the foundation of today's Turkey. One of those in favor of the oppression and persecution of the Christians, Dr. M. Nazim, describes their motives in this way. The Ottoman Empire should consist of Turks. The existence of alliance becomes a reason for Europeans to invade the country. These elements should be Turkified by force. The strategy was to use that kind of propaganda to organize the racists in Turkey. This country belongs to us. Not until the last Turk disappears will we allow anybody else to rule this land. With these words quoted from the program of Itihad Teraki, the power of the young Turks grew and they made people join them. In the rest of Europe, at this time, the bells tolled for the approach of a major war. The Ottoman Empire prepared for it and conscripted every boy and every man able to carry a weapon to do their safir belik, their military service. This political move was also a preparation for the attacks on the Christians. In July 1914, the First World War began. In November of that year, the Ottoman Empire allied itself to Germany. At the same time as the Christians of Balkan freed themselves of the Ottoman Empire, even the people of Greece, Serbia, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Romania, Egypt and Arabia managed to liberate themselves. In sheer desperation, the Ottoman rulers now directed their attention towards Anatolia, Trakia and Beth Narin. They knew they couldn't get back the land they'd lost, but at least they could keep Beth Narin, Trakia, and Anatolia, which were still in their power. In order not to lose these provinces populated by Christians such as Assyrians, Syriacs, and Armenians, they realized the plans of Seyfel, the year of the sword. Preparing is not only that there is an order uh, to make this and this and count the people. The first preparation of the genocide was the ideology of the young Turks, the Turkification, the Turkification, uh, the ideology of the pan turanism which was like in a very similar way, like the Nazi ideology 
of purification of the race. We can say that the pan-Turkism, the ideology of pan-Turkism, was a racistic ideology, and uh, it didn't stop with the Christians. After this was done, the next step was to Turkey, to, to Turkify the Kurdish. So, of course, it is a racistic ideology which was preparing the soil. The Ottoman Empire, then ruled by young Turks like Talat Pasha, Önder Pasha and Kemal Pasha, launched this plan in order to realize their goal, which was an empire without Christians, but populated by Turkish people only. The Christians living in the Eastern Empire were described as an internal tumor that had to be cut away. Thus, the First World War became an excuse for the genocide named Seyfo. The decision, which was taken in April 1915 in Constantinople, declared the Christians traitors and enemies and the expulsion initiated. The target was ethnic and religious purge. The Young Turks started by deporting Armenians and Greeks to the desert with neither food nor water. The Germans were the Ottomans' allies. In the interest of not having the Christians helping and supporting their enemies, Russia, England and France, the Germans looked away, thereby giving their silent consent to the genocide. This is a newspaper named Jihad. It is printed 1915. Where is it printed? Can you see this? It is printed in Berlin. Uh, the mastermind of Jihad, which led to genocide, was the German Foreign Office of Berlin. We must differentiate between the military and the politics. These are two things. It is not so easy. We cannot blame or it is not possible to blame the German military, because there is no any proof that the German military was directly involved in the genocide. No, this is not. This, this the dirty job, the Turkish made it, and they also used the Kurds to make the dirty job. So we must differentiate who did it and who was thinking it out, who has had the idea, the concept, the concept. The concept came from Germany, though it was not with the aim that the Christian population of Turkey should be killed. We cannot say that this was the aim of Germany. Of course it was not. When it happened, and when it became known by the witnesses and by the reports of many, including German people, one of the most important source that it came, uh, became known was uh, the documentation of Johannes Lepsius, who is a German. And what happened was that the politician said, this is not allowed to print. We are in war and German interests are at stake. So no way that this can be printed. This was the second step to suppress all things what was making known the genocide. The German embassy got from all the German consuls the report and they knew about all what happened. They knew from the beginning how the genocide was carried out and they did not do anything or any blaming to stop it. Hey. When the Assyrian Syriacs talk about these tragic times, they often use the word sword, seifu. There is a common saying that during that winter, red snow fell to warn them against blood-stained enemy swords. Another reason for using the word sword, seifu, is also that Muslim sultans repeatedly attacked them and their religion. It's therefore come to symbolize the sword of Islam. Seifo and the red snow are expressions that have engraved themselves on Georgis' memory. Georgis Shabo Afrim, who is 90 years old, today lives in the town of Serdetelje in Sweden. This elderly gentleman is a Syrian Syriac and an eyewitness to the history so weighed down with distress and massacres. Apart from being a surviving witness of Seifo, he forever carries the traces of the tragedy on his own body. 
يكونوا على يد ايمي وينو واتيو طايو من ابنو بن ايمي الروحي كيتو بيتقي في قم صدره وينو بيدانو ومن مالخ مو بنو لخ روحني وملكتو نعم حد جلا ومر مو بنو له لو تتعمي قطن وبريده ومر قتل وبريدي مد لي بيدي ومحيل لي خنجر بحاطي على حاطي بانتو دبثا بحنا لي خنجر بحنا قل لي نعم ومو شرو ديعيتو مفرجق لي قرع يا ديعاتو قايو بصبعوتي يحرم حزين اني هاد مفرجق قرعي ومن لو معلو قطلتي قاتي معلو هادي دكتو دو خنجر يحولو ايه أنا دكتور دخان دو طايم حيل اليوم مختاره يعني. ما بقصلي قصلة. من البابي شلا جولي حالق ليلة البابي شلا جولي حالق ليلة The men were killed, the women were raped, killed or abducted along with the children. People were murdered in a most brutal and inhumane way. Some were beheaded, others hanged. Some burnt alive or had their bellies split open. The barbarism and brutality knew no limits. It was considered holy to kill everybody. Children, grown-ups, women, old people, priests. Jihad, the holy Muslim war had been declared and the murdering of Christians was legitimate. The young Turks demanded that villages and towns be leveled to the ground. The people were to be expelled or killed. There shouldn't be one stone built upon stone left, nor one head left upon a body. According to the Christian European missionaries in the province of Urmia, Seifo began during the first months of 1915. They documented the genocide in the letters and reports they sent back to their own countries. A letter sent from Tibriz on March the 17th, 1915 by missionary F.N. Jessup. When the roads were passable again, we learned what had happened to the Christian population in Salamas and Urmia. 17,000 or 18,000 Assyrian Syriac Christians were forced out onto the roads. In the Salamas Valley, nobody found anywhere to rest their heads. In the early morning hours, there were refugees who died of the cold. During the 90 years we've resided here, we've never witnessed anything worse than what happened to the Assyrian Syriac Nestorians from Urmia. So far, 1,000 people have been murdered and 2,000 have died of disease. Of the 30,000 people who fled, 7,000 are now dead. Their villages have been looted and burned. Their churches lay in ruins. And those who have survived are forced to find their way through the province of Kafkasia in a state of starvation and exhaustion. In the places where Seifo was initiated, the same method was almost always used. In order to weaken the Assyrian Syriacs, their leaders were selected, gathered and murdered. For instance, in the town Midyat, which was the trading center of North Bethnarim, the men of the Hirmis family were captured, since they were well-known leaders. Jebrael Barasso, who was 10 years old at the time, has a vivid memory of how they were taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. 
הקזנדה, הקדוק הזה, לא קודם על המללי, סקר תרעפה, מפחנה, מתן לא חביס. ראיתי שכמו יום אמר חביס, עוד אחים הוא אמר לזה, לא קראת לו. עוד אחים הוא אמר, לא קראת לו, הוא מוקטרקט על מבלילה, מפחד לימו חביס. ומאסרי, מקאידי, מקאידי בזנגר, ומבלילה, לא קראת לו. After Midyat had been cleared of Christians, the Ottoman forces and their allied Kurdish people turned their attention towards Einwad, or Iwardo. The reason for this was that Iwardo had become the defences of Turabdi. From the towns Kerburan to Midyat, from the villages Zaz to Mizizakh, everybody who'd survived in the province of Turabdin in north Bethnarin fled to the village Iwardo. The two sisters, Ziane and Farida Rehawi, were among those refugees. Assyrian Syriacs were confined in Iwardo for a total of 92 days, and their situation had become precarious. They'd run out of ammunition, and the defenders of Iwardo no longer died from the enemy's bullets. Instead, they fell victims to starvation and disease. Even though the people were not organized, there were individuals who managed to assemble them to form a defense and to fight to the bitter end. In the east, in the Hakari province, the East Assyrian's church's patriarch, St. Shamon Benjamin, became aware that Seifo was closing in on them too. To prevent his people suffering the same fate, he decided that they should leave for the mountains. He showed great courage and managed to get his people to defend themselves for more than eight months. But the attackers were superior in numbers and militarily stronger, and the few Assyrian Syriacs who survived were forced to retreat and run away to Urmia. The town Hazakh, the villages Iwardo, Pnebil, Ha, Dairo Duslibu Umur Marke, the monastery of St. Marke became the Ark of Turabdin that saved the Assyrian Syriacs from total destruction. Other places were cleared altogether and there was nothing left of the Assyrian Syriac names. For example, Hekari Botan is empty of any Christian. There were nobody left. Um, in your parts, not only to Abdin, but Orfa and uh, all the, like Mardin, Diyabaka, all where the population of uh, West Assyrians were living, also, they, uh, as a consequence of genocide, they emigrated. They emigrated to Lebanon, emigrated then later to America, and uh, also some, some years later to Syria, uh, because of the new uh, states and borders. So this is one thing, the time, 1915 ended the time where Assyrians, even in different denominations, were geographical homogeneous. That was Upper Mesopotamia. Your people, it doesn't matter, or Jacobite, Nestor, and Kalia, any names you call yourself, but all you were living in one part, which was that time Upper Mesopotamia. And this uh, period ended. Seifo cost the Christians immensely. 
over one and a half million people had to sacrifice their lives. The genocide, which lasted between 1914 and 1918, claimed over 500,000 victims among the Assyrian Syriacs only. Tens of thousands were deported to camps and tens of thousands fled to escape death. Two thirds of the Assyrian total number were killed and vanished and driven out. No! 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 Sefo was the destruction not only of people, but of an ancient civilization. Priceless cultural treasures which had formed a bridge between the Muslim and Christian religion, between Greek and Arabic knowledge. Also threatened by total destruction was the language Syrian. The Aramaic dialect with its unique alphabet spoken by Jesus Christ and still spoken by the Assyrian Syriacs today. Who knows how many Bibles were burnt in the churches? How many holy scriptures on science and philosophy thrown into the rivers? How many stories were buried with the old people who were slaughtered? How many love poems half kept in the hearts of young girls? How many lullabies have been sung by mothers to their infants? Cradle songs that the descendants are forever deprived of. This is the cry that was called out in 1915, the cry that every day resounds in the minds of the children of new generations of Assyrians, Syriacs, growing up today. When will the world around us hear it? And when will the wound from Sefo, the wound in the hearts and minds of this people, when will it ever heal? This people, whose culture and history go back 6,500 years, should it not belong to the riches of our world? Should it not be allowed to color our lives? This cry that has been heard now will turn into a cry of hope for the eyewitnesses of Sefo and for their people. It will heal their wounds, give their lives new hope, prepare them for new times to come. Allow them to discover new paths leading to life without fear, without violence, and most important of all, life without cries. Life without men like Talat and Hitler. Look. 